The entire month of September is dedicated to the seven sorrows of Our Lady, and so I want to talk about about those today. Devotion to Our Lady is a very important part of our spiritual life, and a very important part of devotion to Our Lady is devotion to her seven sorrows. I think ordinarily we think of our Blessed Mother as someone with great power, as the Queen of Heaven, or we think of her as the Mother of God, and as our own Mother, someone who has a power over us and protects us. And Our Lady, of course, is all of these things. But we often don't often think of her as someone having her own sufferings, her own difficulties. But Our Lady is our co-redemptrix. She also participated in our redemption by her sufferings. And she is the queen of martyrs. She suffered more in this world than any human being ever could or ever did. And we can't understand her role. We can't even have a proper devotion to her at all without a devotion to her seven sorrows. Now, there is a lot that has been written by the saints about the sorrows of Our Lady. You could fill countless books on this subject and, and never even scratch the surface. It's a mystery we can never grasp. And it's mysterious in, in many different ways. But one book that I like to recommend a lot, because it is very accessible, very easy to understand, is St. Alphonsus's book called The Glories of Mary. It's like a great masterpiece of devotion to Our Lady, in which she covers every aspect of devotion to her. It's like a manual of, of devotion to her. So, of course, he has a long section in it about Our Lady's sorrows, both in, in general and for each one of them in particular. He treats each of her seven sorrows rather extensively, we don't, have to, we don't have time to go into everything that he says about all of them today. I thought it would be better to just take the first of her seven sorrows and see what St. Alphonsus had to say about that. The first of Our Lady's seven sorrows, of course, is the prophecy of St. Simeon. When Our Lady took the baby Jesus to the temple as a newborn infant to perform the rite of purification... And St. Simeon, the priest, performed the ceremony. And he was inspired by the Holy Ghost to know who he was speaking with. And he said that he had prayed his whole life that he would live long enough to see the Savior of the world. And at this point, he was a very old man. And he said that now God could take him from this earth because he had just received the one thing that he wanted in his life which was to see God himself. But then he said to Our Lady that a sword of sorrow would pierce her heart because Our Lord would be contradicted by many, many people. This was a terrible grief for, for Our Lady because it told her what to expect in the future, that she would have terrible sufferings waiting for her. We've all heard the expression that this life is a veil of tears. We all know that we have to suffer in this world. But by the mercy of God, the future is hidden from us. We don't know what problems we will have to suffer in the future. There was a pagan philosopher who said that if someone could see the future, he would suffer terribly by anticipation. His whole life would be miserable, even if he was doing just fine in, in the present moment. Because just the thought of what he could see was going to happen to him would take away any happiness that he could ever enjoy. And so, because of this, we only endure the sorrows of life one time, when they actually happen to us. But Our Lady did not have this benefit God wanted her to be like her son in all things. And we know that, that Jesus, being God, could see the future. 
and the sufferings of his passion from the very moment of his conception. And we know that that foreknowledge caused him incredible suffering throughout his entire life on earth. And he wanted to give a similar form of suffering to his holy mother so that she could suffer with him and earn merit during her entire life by this suffering. Our Lady told the great mystic Saint Matilda that when Saint Simeon prophesied this to her, all of her joy was changed into sorrow because even though she had already known that her son would be sacrificed for the salvation of mankind, she didn't know in great detail what that would consist of until she was told by Saint Simeon that our Lord would in fact be rejected and contradicted and people would not believe in him. And we see this in our Lord's life. Even the high priest Caiaphas said that our Lord blasphemed when he said that he was God and that he deserved to be put to death. People contradicted almost everything that our Lord said in the gospel. For example, even though our Lord was of royal descent, he was considered a peasant. People said, isn't this the carpenter's son? He was infinite wisdom itself. And yet people treated him as if he were ignorant. They said, how does this man know letters having never learned? He was the greatest prophet that could ever live, and yet the soldiers during his passion blindfolded him and, and hid him and said, prophesy, who is it that struck thee? People called him a madman. They said he was a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of publicans and sinners. People said that he cast out devils by the prince of devils. They said that he, he himself was in fact possessed by the devil. All of these statements are written in the Gospels. In fact, people thought that he was so wicked that when the Jews brought him before Pilate, and Pilate asked what crime our Lord had committed, they acted as though they didn't even need to put him on trial because his crimes were so notorious. They said, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him to thee. And even in a certain sense, our Lord's heavenly Father contradicted him because he prayed for his chalice to be taken away from him of course, subject to the will of God. And God the Father did not grant him that request. And as our Lord knelt in the Garden of Olives and he knew that he must endure his passion, he was so overcome with fear and sadness that he trembled and he sweat blood. He was so persecuted and, and contradicted in his life that he was even tortured in every part of his body and he shed all of his blood and he was the object of scorn and mockery by the very people who put him on the cross. The, the method of crucifixion was one that was used only for people who were considered to deserve no compassion or consideration of any kind. That was the extent of our Lord's rejection by mankind. There are other times in Scripture when someone was given a prophecy of some misfortune or punishment that would fall upon them that hadn't happened yet what was going to happen in the future. And in every case, it, it crushed their soul. King David was told by the prophet Nathan that his infant son was going to be born dead. And despite all of the joy and comfort and pleasure of, of the royal court, King David could find no peace after hearing that. It says that he wept and fasted and even slept on the ground just from knowing that his son was going to die. And of course, Our Lady received these words from St. Simeon, with great peace and accepted it as God's will without the slightest objection. But she still suffered constantly. 
Every time she looked at her divine son after this, she knew and she saw how holy and good and beautiful he was. And she thought about how badly he would be treated by the entire human race. It was a constant agony for her. Our Lady said something like this to St. Bridget. She said that when she was on earth, there was not a single moment in which this great suffering didn't pierce her soul. She said, as often as I looked at my son, as often as I wrapped him in swaddling clothes, as often as I saw his hands and feet, so often was my soul absorbed in more grief, for I thought of how he would be crucified. So the greater was the love that she had for our Lord, the greater was her sorrow at the thought of what his own creatures would do to him. He was the Lord of the world, and he would be bound like a criminal. He was the creator of all things, and he would be beaten with blows until he was bruised all over. He was the judge of the world, and he himself was going to be unjustly condemned. He was the glory of heaven, and he would be despised by mankind. And even though he was the king of kings, he would wear a crown of thorns. When Our Lady wrapped up the baby Jesus in swaddling clothes, it made her think of the time that he would be tied with ropes. When she carried him in her arms, she thought of of the cross that he would be nailed to. And when she saw him sleeping, it made her think of the day when she would see him dead. And every time she put his clothes on him, she thought about how one day his clothes would be torn off of him so that he could be tortured and crucified. When she saw his hands and feet, she thought of the day that they would be pierced with nails. And Our Lady said to St. Bridget, My eyes filled with tears and my heart was tortured with grief. The entire duration of our Lord's childhood and the years in which he grew up are summarized in Holy Scripture by the short phrase that our Lord advanced in wisdom and age. This doesn't mean that he became more wise since he was always infinitely holy. But it means that he advanced in in the love and esteem of others, especially in that of his Holy Mother. The more years that Our Lady spent living with our Lord, the more she loved him. But the more she loved him, the more also her grief increased at the thought of his passion. In fact, as the time of his passion came nearer and nearer, it, it filled her more and more with sorrow. This is a very important thought for us to think about how much suffering both our Lord and our Lady wanted to suffer for our sins and for our redemption. And because of this thought, we should not complain when we have to suffer ourselves. We should instead unite our sufferings with theirs and accept it as coming from the hand of God. There was one time a holy nun who had been suffering a terrible affliction for a long time. And our Lord appeared to her on the cross and he encouraged her to stay with him on the cross and suffer with him. And she said, Lord, thou art tortured on the cross for only three hours and I have endured my pain for many years. Seems like a strange thing to say to our Lord, but... She must have been under a terrible amount of pain uh, to have said something like that. But our Lord said, ignorant soul, what dost thou say? From the very moment of my conception, I suffered in heart everything that I afterwards endured dying on the cross. And our Lord can very easily say the same thing to us. We can never experience even a tiny fraction of the amount of suffering that he endured for us. St. Alphonsus closes this chapter with a very beautiful story from the the Chronicles of the Jesuits. 
He says that there was a young man who was devoted to Our Lady, and every day he would go and kneel in front of a statue of Our Lady of Sorrows that showed her heart being pierced with seven swords. One day, unfortunately, he committed a mortal sin. But the next day, fortunately, he went to pray in front of the statue, as he always did. But when he got there, he saw that the statue was now pierced with eight swords instead of seven. And he was amazed at this, and he wondered what that eighth sword meant. And he heard a voice telling him that his sin had stabbed Our Lady's heart for the eighth time. And he was so sorry for what he did that he immediately went to confession. Devotion to the sorrows of Our Lady, as she has revealed to many of her closest friends, is something that Our Lady loves very, very much and rewards very highly. Let us think about these things and meditate them on them during this month of September and also during the whole year. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.